Hello, and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental nerds, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Nick and I discuss leave policies and taking leave. I interviewed Tom Reese because Nick is in Germany, and we talk about seagrass, permitting, and Ecosphere Restoration Institute. And finally, today's fun fact from Keep Prince William Beautiful, the world's oldest trees are 4,600 years old. They're Bristol Pines, and they are in the U.S. The Great Basin Bristol Cone Pine, Pinus longevia, <laughs> has been deemed the oldest tree in existence, reaching an age of over 5,000 years old. The Bristol Cone Pine's success in living a long life can be attributed to the harsh conditions it lives in. Very cold temperatures associated with high winds, in addition to a slow growth rate, create dense wood, meaning some years they grow so slowly they don't add a ring of growth. Well, then how do they know? <laughs> They're like the Benjamin Buttons of the world. They're like the Benjamin Buttons of the tree world. Sam, where's your reaction? Yes, they are, Laura. <laughs> there it is, Nick. Got her on the show. <laughs> Hit that music. Right. All things considered, our first Ask Me Anything, held on Tuesday, April 11th, went pretty well. We had 13 of our past guests join us and a half an hour of questions from the audience answered. You can catch the recording on our YouTube page by searching for EPR Podcast on YouTube and clicking on the live video section. I'm sorry, folks. Nick isn't here today to do a funny sponsor bit. So head on over and check out our sponsor options on our website at www.environmentalprofessionalsradio.com. We're about to hit 40,000 downloads. This is a great opportunity to reach your target audience. Let's get to our segment. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. I've never worked at a company with policy like that. So how does that work if everyone wants to, because most companies everywhere I've ever worked is like, we need staff. We have someone has to be here during the day or whatever. So if you give people free license to take off whenever they want without having to check other people's calendars, how does the place stay afloat or the work oh. get done? This is funny. You know, I literally just had this conversation yesterday with my brother. So my brother works <laughs> in uh, property management and he was talking about his policy. And our, they're very similar. And so I'll, I really, I'll talk more about ours. Oh, interesting. There's always a, re a request for time off, right? It's not a guarantee that you will get it. It is a re request. I would like this time off, right? And the earlier you do that, the better, because if there are things that we, there are days or times that we need people, then we have to make sure that we have staff, right? Or if there's like a deadline for like a financial thing, right? Where everyone, or all project managers have to get all of their invoices in by the end of the month and there's an audit coming. Like you have to finish that before you go anywhere. And so it doesn't matter. It's like, yeah, you can take the time so long as this is done, right? But, you know, we have calendars for that. And so the, the real challenge is like, is just making sure that nobody books the exact same time for everything, right? If it's everybody books the same day off and it's a federal holiday, it's not a big deal, right? So if it's, if it's mm -hmm. Veterans Day and, you know, we can choose when to do it, Veterans Day is really easy. Most people will take that day. Not everybody will, but most people will. So then you only have a few people who are taking it at different times the rest of the month. So it's just a matter of kind of coordination. Like, I think, I don't think I've ever said, no, you can't take the time for any of my staff, but if that was what happened and there has been, there have been times where we've had like two out of the three people that needed to be gone, were gone. And the third person asked, and you're like, do you have a backup person for this? And they did. And it's like, okay, fine. It's going to be a crazy day, but it's just one day, you know, like three weeks of that. No, it doesn't work. So if everybody wants to take the same, you know, Italian vacation, <laughs> that's going to be a little harder, but, but you know, I think Marketing most departments going on a cruise, but yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right in the middle of proposal season, right? Like, so for me and like anyone working on proposals and, you know, working with the federal calendar, right? The federal fiscal year ends September 30th. So that means August, September are not great travel day, travel months. It's not a good idea to do it. I had to leave for a project for a week in August and it was brutal. It was really difficult. It was like, you know, 12, 13 hour days, which I don't like doing just to try to get this day above water. But that was, it couldn't be helped. And that's, you know, it happens. But typically, like, you know, that's those are the two months where it's like we need to buckle down, stay home, be home, get stuff done. Anything else outside of that is usually pretty flexible. It's very rare that people would pick the same thing. 
the same okay. day. So that's, yeah, that's, so that's the scheduling. So other than that, I mean, how do you get people who aren't like, I'm taking six months off? I mean, you say it's like unlimited, but is yeah. it really? <laughs> yeah, no, no, of course not. Like it's, it's one of those things where if you said, okay, I'm taking six months off. I'm like, okay, well, don't come back. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, we're not going to pay for six months. And, you know, like I said, that's why it's a request, because if it's an unreasonable request, we would say no. And you can decline and deny the request. And then if they take the time anyway, after that, then that's a different issue. But yeah, yeah. Truthfully, like some companies are doing it because it's a lot cheaper than giving you PTO. Mm-hmm. Because if you give people PTO and they leave, you have to pay them for the PTO. Gotcha. Yeah. Whereas if you have unlimited time off, you're not. So right. kind of a, a tricky workaround. So get your time, you know, take your time. I mean, that's really how, how I use it. It's like, it's like, you're not going to get the money for it. Then take your time. Take it, you know? Just don't do it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you prioritize your staff and your folks? I mean, like you, you have a, a group of people you work with in different avenues and not even in the same company, just different things that you're doing. So uh, how do you coordinate all of those moving parts? Because there's lots of different people that you work with on a semi-daily basis and some that you don't. But like that has to be a lot more complicated than, than like a, you know, a company structured policy. Yeah. Everyone I work with is part-time. Okay. So they basically, and one of the things, so I like to hire students and people who've just graduated younger persons who are still needing to get some experience and they're, you know, willing to learn. And so I, I give them a lot of leeway to fail on the job and also to give me their ideas Help me stay young. I don't have kids. Yeah. <laughs> Help me relate to the younger world. And at the same time, I give them a lot of leeway on when and how they work. So basically, we usually meet like every other week, talk about what they've been working on, what they're going to work for the next week. And then they know as long as if there's something they're putting out that has to like an email or a post or something or any kind of work like that someone's going to see. I mean, I, I now work with people all over the world. So as long as they're doing the work sometime within the United States morning, evening time, <laughs> it's okay. Right. Right. Uh, we're not looking for like a 3 a.m. email out to someone. But yeah, I haven't had any problem. Like, I think probably the same with you. You hire the right people who aren't going to take advantage of it and are reasonable people, you know, I, I, then you don't end up with those issues. I think the problem is going to be if you own a blockbuster music and you give. <laughs> your young people and the people that you hire who work for minimum wage free license to take any time off they want that that's who's going to abuse it right <laughs> well yeah and it was different because yeah that's a, it's a good point every business is different and every business is going to have different rules and requirements but it's funny because you know my brother and i talking about it in two totally different industries with, with the same exact policy i thought that was pretty cool because it's yeah. it's kind of like yeah we all have to kind of deal with this this is all requests if everybody takes off the same day that we're having you know a fiscal audit or whatever that's not good. <laughs> you know, someone's got to answer the questions that they're going to ask. And so there's certain days where it's, it's really hard to do that. I mean, usually you can move things around, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have hard deadlines. And, you know, like September 30th is a very hard deadline for us to get proposals in. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that whole, those whole two months is, is so crazy. And there's so much we need to get done in that period. It's really hard to take off. And, you know, August, September are, you know, pretty good vacation months. Most people take June, July, but we try to balance that too. If someone really, really wants to go to, you know, Europe for a month, I can accommodate it to a degree. You know, it's, if they want to go for like a year, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want. Yeah. That's probably a good chance to uh, give a shout out to our assistant, Sherry, because she's been working with us the whole time behind the scenes and very, very, very behind the scenes. And anytime <laughs> yeah. she goes on vacation or something, you know, it's just, it's communicating. She doesn't have to submit a request, but at least, you know, she'll let us know. And then we know that we have to, like you said, if someone's there to do the backup, then we know that it needs to be done and someone else will take care of it. But it's nice to give it back when she comes back. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Do you have people that ask to go like travel and work? So I, Instead of asking for vacation or maybe asking for just half my vacation, if I go to Montana, but I'm still going to work half the day, you know, or even the whole time, like do my full time job somewhere else. Do people ask for remote work for a while or something? I mean, you kind of all work remote anyway. Does Do you even know if somebody moved to another state for six months? Uh, we have to know if they move. We have to okay. know that for tax purposes. They're not allowed to just move. Okay. And not tell us. And that's actually a good question because this has come up a couple of times in our 
group. And I like to know where people are for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, if we're talking time zones, I don't want to bother you and I don't want you to bother me when we're, you know, out of our work windows, unless it's an emergency, right? If there is an emergency, whether it's a natural disaster or whatever else it could be, and I think that you're in that area and you're not, that's not a great thing for us from a safety perspective. Like, I, you know, I don't want people to worry about the situations. You know, we have somebody who lives, for example, on, on the coast and we get hurricanes. And if that person is not there and they're, you know, they, they get battered and I'm, you know, really concerned about that. You know, I, I would like to know. On a whole, it doesn't really matter. I try to say, you know, like, I don't care where you are. I just care that it gets done. I don't. But at the same time, I also want everyone to take time. Like, if you're going to be in Montana for a month, take two weeks off, you know, enjoy not working. And like, you know, I had this experience in like Alaska, hiking up a glacier, just being like, this is absolutely fantastic. I am having the best time. My face the whole time is just, you know, ear to ear grin, you know, and you can't get that at work. Sometimes it's hard to get that kind of experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. So ironically, our, our industry does kind of have some of those moments, but you have to be able to appreciate and enjoy them, you know, not just, oh, this is a great glacier. Can't wait to go back home and write, you know, my TPS <laughs> yeah. or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> take on. my laptop on this hike. <laughs> yeah. 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 You've got <laughs> to be able get to access at the top of the hill. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like both, you know, visit family. That's a, that's the biggest one, like especially during the pandemic, do what you need to do. You know, like if yeah. you need to be at home with your family, we had people who, who moved back in with their parents for, you know, months. Because, you know, they wanted to be with family and have that unit be together. So, okay, of course. Yeah. You know, that doesn't matter at all. Just, I don't want to be like, hey, I need you to run to the post office in, you know, McLean, Virginia and pick up something for the company. And you're like, oh, I can't because I'm in Las Vegas or whatever. <laughs> you know, that's why it's, it's, it's better to know than not. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, why don't we uh, go ahead and get to our interview? Sounds good. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have my dear friend, Tom Reese, who is the founder and president of ERI, the Ecosphere Restoration Institute, back on the show. Nick is off having a great time in Germany, so we will be doing this one solo. So, Tom, thanks for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Laura. It's good to be back. So how have you been, Tom? Last time we talked, you were still working full time with ESA, and now you are retired. And are you full time now with ERI? I am, Laura. After 40 years of working full time in the last 20 doing Ecosphere and ESA, it feels good to just do one of these. <laughs> I could only imagine. So I know that you had to work the last couple of years that you were with still with ESA after they were after they had bought Shada, right? So you were actually with Shada most of that time challenging my yeah. brain here. And so do you have any lessons learned for people when their companies are bought out by another company? No, that's a great question. When I was at Shada, we had a lot of companies wanting to acquire us. And we just said no for many years. But then we had a company that was very persistent. So we said, let's at least go through this and see what it's all about. And in the end, it's a point where you have to make a decision. So we asked for the weekend to think about it. And that Sunday morning, I woke up and said, what are we doing? I'm not comfortable yet. And why are we letting firms come to us? Why don't we <laughs> look for a firm? So we asked the firm to put it on ice for six weeks. And then I made some calls because I'd heard about ESA out of California, and they seem to have very similar ethics mm -hmm. and corporate culture. So I called the president, and he said, you know what, you are on our list to contact <laughs> one day. So we started a whole conversation, and it was such a perfect match. I didn't want all our employees to be looking for a job when Sandy Shada and I wanted to retire. Right. So we really wanted a place for our employees. And, and again, it was such a perfect match. So after four years of part of our commitment to stay, actually I stayed for five, 
I've said, you know, doing both of these is too much work. <laughs> and um, plus, I just heard 65, and I'm like, maybe I should cut down to one. So as of beginning of this year, I'm just doing Ecosphere. Awesome. And so, so far, how are things going now that you can dedicate more time to Ecosphere? Well, it's going great. <laughs> I mean, I didn't realize how much pressure it was doing both. I mean, it really felt like a weight, physical weight came off my shoulders. So even though I'm still kind of right now working 30 hours a week, it sure beats the 60 plus. Right. That's what it was. Yeah, that five years went by fast. I remember when that all started, right? <laughs> yeah, time is flying, especially as you get older. Right. And then so they made you stay on for a couple of years before they it's not like you sell the company and you just ditch. So that's correct. It was a four year commitment. And, you know, I stayed for five because I really liked it. I liked who I worked with. I liked the work we were doing. It just was just I could feel the stress on it. And again, 20 years ago, when I started doing both, it was no big deal. But the last five years, I felt it. And so you just got to say, you know, you think about your health. And I like both of them, but I couldn't do it anymore. So it really feels good now. Yeah, that's really great. And I mean, you're working on, we talked about this last time you were on 40 projects and they're awesome projects, both with ESA and then your projects with Ecosphere. But we didn't get to talk about Ecosphere a whole lot and we focused more on your your other work. So why don't you tell us some of the projects and, and the properties that you've worked on and are currently working on with Ecosphere? Sure. So Ecosphere was started because all the restoration projects that I'd have ever done prior were all on public land. And that's great, public dollars on public land. But there are many places that should be restored, preserved, that aren't public land. You think of 22% of Florida's public. So almost 80% is off the table when it comes to restoring some properties. So we started Ecosphere as to really push the, public-private partnership. And that means I would look at a aerial of an area in historic images, and you'd find an old creek that used to flow to the bay that was dredged in the 1940s. And if we could fix that, because it was right in the Liga hailing zone, which is a low salinity zone, which is perfect for juvenile fish, that would be really impactful. But it's private land. <laughs> so if you can talk to private landowners, especially corporations, you could, some of them see the value of doing the right thing. And so we get all the funding and we restore their land, but they have to put a conservation easement over it, permanent conservation. And so it's a win-win situation. So that's what the Ecosphere started. And so when you ask what projects I've been doing, I'll talk about the public-private sector first. And so Tampa Electric Company is our premier partner. This is project number seven, and we've restored now over 70 acres and put 100 acres under conservation easement. That's awesome. And now we're doing a living shoreline project on that same creek. So it's a demo site, so waterfront owners and see what living shorelines are about. And they, in some places, you don't need a seawall. You really need to protect your property with more natural approach. So I'll stop there, but that's our biggest project under the public-private partnership. We have several other projects where we're working on public land. Right. I love the public-private partnerships. That's always been, I think, when I was working with you before, a really wonderful niche. And I think that, you know, it it has such nuances, though, in getting that work accomplished. So what have you learned maybe that could help other people who might need to work with private landowners and to try to, um, you know, collaborate more, be more persuasive with them? Well, these are harder. Okay. Yeah. I, I equate it to a house of cards. You have many participants, participants and they all have to stand long enough for to get this project in the ground. 
And I've had several that somebody pulled a card and everything collapsed. So mm-hmm. they're harder, but they're really rewarding. And for the private landowner, it gives them a chance to get positive PR. And I'll gladly help them get positive PR because without their help, we couldn't be restoring this land. So it's a win, 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 but it's, it's, you got to find the right partners. And so to answer your question, it's a lot of communication, education, and some trust. Luckily, we've been doing these for a while, so we can show results. It's not like the first one. And so that helps them feel comfortable going into an agreement with us. Right. Do you have a, a running list or tally of how many acres you've restored under this programs? Well, for just Tico alone, we restored 70 acres and protected 100. And we're doing now another eight more with them with the Living Shoreline. And so we've done a couple other ones. And so they were 25 acres. They were smaller ones. But now that I have all this time, (laughs) I'm going to try and find some bigger bigger projects on a P3 um, scenario. Nice. You mentioned that you get the funding for those projects. Are they, or do you get grants for them? How do you find the, the money for those? Yeah, all of this is grant funding. So, for example, with Tampa Electric, they put 50000 down and we'll get a grant, a local grant, and then we'll go for a state. And now we quadrupled their money. And most of the time, when Tampa Electric wanted to continue to do this, they actually bought other sections of that same creek so we can restore it. So they usually have way more match than we need to restore it. For example, when we were doing phase three at Newman Branch, they wrote a check for 550000 And within two weeks, we bought another 14 acres. And then for about 220000 we restored that land. So it's a win-win again. Because we have more match than we need, which helps you when you're trying to get funding, especially grants. And these projects would never happen because the public agencies do not typically work on private land. Right. And then so you also have to do the actually do the work. So (laughs) who does the work on these projects? (laughs) No, that's a great component. It's first thing is find the property, get the agreement, design it and permit it. That's what we do. Then we have a stable of contractors and consultants. And it ranges from surveyors to geotech engineers to heavy equipment operators to plant nurseries and all the typical elements to put a project in the ground. And so for a contractor to get in our stable, they have to show us what they charge the state either how much they charge for a plant or how much they charge for an hour. If they drop their those rates by 10%, then they're in our stable. So we are effectively getting all these services for 10% less than if the state was hiring them to do it. So again, it's a win-win. Now, especially for consultants, your profit margin is only at 10 to 12% at best. So if I'm asking them to take 10% off, it's a lot. But it helps because we're not in a hurry to get these done. We're not their normal client that needs to have it done tomorrow. Right. We have time. And so they can take our project off the shelf when they're slow. And so for them, that's their ticket to drop their price. They get to do projects on their time. And we usually get high profile projects or award winning projects and their name is on that. So if that's the model we've come up with and it seems to work. That's really great. And then the, when we worked together, when we first started working together, a lot of what we talked about was permitting and getting through the ridiculously tight processes because they treated you the same as any developer coming in. And I think we made some headways throughout the years, but um, where are things at now? And I think there's some other activities that you're hoping to change. 
How's permitting for habitat restoration today? Well, it's still hard. It's amazing that a state agency that's charged with doing restoration has to get a state permit, right? If they are knowing what they're doing, why can't they just proceed? You still need your federal permit, and there are a lot of exemptions through the federal process, like a nationwide 27 from the core, which is pretty easy permit to get. It's ironic here in Florida that the state permit is one of the harder ones Mm -hmm. to get. And then in some counties, they have their own third layer environmental protection. And so you have to get a permit from them. And they were not set up initially for restoration projects. They're set up for protecting the resources from development. And so there's no easy path to, for them to give us an exemption or expedited permit. And so there has been some improvements in the last seven years for living shorelines, but it still has a long way to go. And so we constantly are trying to push to get the rules changed to make it easier to do these projects. There's only so much money. And a lot of these grants have timelines on them. And I've had projects almost not go through because it took so long to get the permits. Right. I'll just say that the Nationwide 54 that the Army Corps put in seven years ago is huge for us. Because prior to that, you don't need a permit to replace your seawall, but you need full permitting to put a living shoreline in. (laughs) <laughs> so with the Nationwide 54, that's an exemption. You just show them that you meet their requirements and you can get this exemption. You can go put the project in. And so the first version of this allowed 750 linear feet of shoreline to be permitted under this exemption, which was great. We had nothing like that before. The redo of it, which came out last March, They lowered it down to 500 linear feet. I'm not sure why, but I wish it was still the 750. That qualifies you to get the quicker permit. So these are things that we're trying to work with the Corps and say, was there a reason? Can we go back to 750 or even higher? And so there there are stuff that's always need to be tweaked to make it a little easier. (laughs) Yeah. So living shorelines, I know that is kind of a Tom Reese thing. and. I know that I've learned a lot from you over the years for about living shorelines. So what's new? What's going on with living shorelines? Are there any new technologies being used? Any great projects you're working on? I know you mentioned the one with Tico already. Yeah, and we're doing one. Right, well, we just finished one first for the city of Tampa where we put 2,000 linear feet in of living shoreline. And so we're constantly doing living shoreline projects. I have two more that are in the pipes as far as trying to get funding for them. But what's new is there are many tools that you can use to break wave energy and protect a shoreline so you can have a natural shoreline behind it. And one of those is oysters put in into mesh bags. And all that is plastic. And we don't want to put more plastic in the water. And so, unfortunately, every alternative up to recently, wouldn't hold up like the plastic does. So we are testing new technologies right now to stay away from plastic and still hold the oyster clutch together long enough so that new oysters can grow over it, and then it provides the shoreline protection and grows as sea sea level rises. And then those projects, you mostly utilize volunteers to put in that work, right? Yeah, and that's the beauty of that. I mean, I could hire contractors to do every aspect of these projects, but then I'm missing a major opportunity for people to get involved, not only for the education, but the ownership and the pride. Because you spend a Saturday morning putting oyster bags in and plants behind it. Every time you drive by there, that's your project, right? And so that instilling that ownership is huge. And I think we should do that on every project because that's the most effective way of getting the word out why it's important to protect 
and restore our ecosystem. Yeah, I think some of your your volunteer days are some of the most fun <laughs> that I recall doing, not just because of the work, but because the other volunteers that come out. I think the culture that you talk about, like you had at Shada and looked to bring in with ESA in the in the buyout and just, you know, you in general, the nice group of people gravitate towards you. <laughs> well, that's why you're here. <laughs> But that leads me to last year in Florida, the seagrass, all the progress. Like what happened? Where did this, the seagrass, for those listening, uh, if you're not familiar with Florida, they had a goal to restore seagrass to the levels that they were in 1950 because they had aerials that they could match them to. And they had actually met that goal for a couple of years. And then last year was just detrimental. So what happened, Tom? Yeah, and it's not just on one side of the state. We have two things that are going on. First of all, we'll talk about here on the West Coast. So we map seagrasses every two years. And I say we because I used to run that program. And as a consultant, we helped the Water Management District do the QC on the maps. So the last three iterations, we saw seagrass declines, which we didn't expect. And we it's a problem when you see it three times in a row. And so even this last round for 22, we lost about couple thousand acres in the lower part and middle part of Tampa Bay. And some of that's due to red tide, higher than normal rainfall. And the biggest thing is the stormwater runoff. You know, we have these presumptive rules by the Water Management District that if you put in a stormwater pond, whether it's a wet detention or, or a dry pond, that they're effective in removing nutrients. We know now that the wet detention ponds, which is used 80% of the time, are not as efficient. They barely get 40% of nitrogen out, which is a limiting factor in Tampa Bay. So as we continue to grow with more populations, even though they're putting stormwater systems in, they're not as effective as they should be. So we need to make bigger ponds. We need to retrofit areas that were built before the rules or we will never be able to keep the seagrass growing the way we want it, or we stop development, right? When Even though <laughs> we should all talk about carrying capacity, that's not going to happen right away. They're going to continue to develop. We just need to make sure the efficiency of these ponds are working. So we have heavy rain years. We don't have so much dark water that the seagrass can't grow. And on top of that, we had the Piney Point incident, which is equivalent of dumping 80,000 bags of fertilizer in the bay all at once. Crazy. So when we had that red tide, which we have here pretty frequently, it was massively exasperated. And it lasted longer than ever. It was like the worst one in 50 years. So that doesn't help our seagrass. So that's the West Coast issues. On the East Coast, there's a lot of development, and most of the canal systems that were built by the quarry decades ago are as a way to move water off quickly, and they had a lot of rain. So they had to open up these canals so they don't have flooding. So that black water, we'll call it, went into the Indian River Lagoon, and it wiped out, essentially, all the seagrass over there. I mean, 40,000-acre loss in the last 8 to 10 years – and in some spots, 90% of the grass gone. So, we, which caused, you know, the highest mortality ever for manatees, oh, over so a thousand in 2021, I think, and another 700 last year. And we only have 5,000 manatees to 7,000. Right. So, that, these are big hits. And so, all the grass is gone over there, and there's no seeds and no rhizome. So we could wait for natural recolonization, which could take years, maybe a decade. But if we could go in there and inoculate these areas, then that would accelerate the regrowth. And so I'm very proud to say that Ecosphere was awarded state appropriation funding six months ago to replant seagrass statewide at the tune of 100 acres. Now, when you think about 45,000 acre loss or 
two to 4,000 acre loss on this coast in this region, that's a drop in the bucket. But in these areas where there's no grass at all, getting some grass in, in these locations is super important to get it to start growing again now that the water quality is back. And all this time, the water management district and the state has been trying to put in offline systems, more stormwater retrofit. So it's not a waste of money. The water quality is improving. We just need to try and accelerate that process so that when we plant them, they don't get wiped out. Yeah, that's, oh, the manatee as the end result is such a horrible, you know. Especially start. A lot of, <laughs> and, and you can see it, right? It's not like a, a die off of bees where nobody notices or a extinction of a, a frog, which is still also very important. But this is a large animal and it's just really sad to see that happen so directly. I mean, that's our food source. So if anyone's listening, doesn't know what manatees are or, or why they're related, seagrass is what they eat. So if there's no seagrass, they starve, which is even th- like the sadder part, right? It is. So uh, hats off to you for doing this work and getting congrats on getting the work to, to replant the seagrass there. So what does that mean for Ecosphere? Do you get to hire staff? Will you be doing this with volunteers? We are not going to use a lot of volunteers, unfortunately. I think seagrass is difficult. And we had a study done here that looked at 33 years of planting seagrass in this region, statewide, actually. And it was like a best 40% survival, which is pretty low. And a lot of that was due for 30 years ago, what they did and what we're doing today. So it's gotten better. The only good news out of that, of that 40% that survived, 80% still here three decades later. So it, what does grow seems to be persistent. And so that study really helps us and how to do this. So there's a few contractors in the state that are good at this. So we are working with one of them and it's Aquatech Solutions. And they've been doing this for a long time. So we were planting 95% of this via our contractor because they have the tools, they know what they're doing, and they have good material that they've harvested in and grow in nurseries and then they can put that into the ground. Now, just ironically, this coming Saturday, tomorrow, we are gonna allow volunteers to put some seagrass in at Eulalie Springs. The contractor put in professional plants, professionally, I mean, and so we left the spots to have some volunteers because I get a lot of calls from volunteers that wanna do something for the manatees. And so I'd like them to have a chance to feel like they're participating. And if they don't all make it, it's still they participated in doing it. And all the plants around them were professionally installed. So hopefully they'll all take. Nice. That's great. So that will have already happened by the time this comes out. But, you know, if you're not already following Ecosphere, you know, pay attention to their website and the work that they're doing, because they're, like I said, the volunteer work that they do put out is some of the best. And most hands-on and, and and projects that you can really, like you said, drive by and be like, cool, I, I participated there. Are there things that people can do to support the seagrass or the manatees on their own? Yeah, there are several things that are easy. I mean, we want our green laws, right? And whether that's right for this latitude, we could argue, but people still like their green laws. What they don't realize is a lot of neighborhoods are getting recycled water or or irrigation. So when, in other words, it's not potable water. What they don't realize is that potable water has 40 to 60% of the nutrients they need to keep the grass green. So people not realizing that, they either pay people to come in to add fertilizer or put it on themselves. And they're following the directions. <laughs> and they're not realizing that you need to only put half or you know, 40% of what they say because your water that you're irrigating with already has nitrogens in it in a liquid form. And so if people just did that, we wouldn't have excess nutrients going on to the receiving water body that they live nearby. And which means less nutrients means 
less algae growing in the water, so more light hits the bottom, so seagrass can grow. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So do you ever get any work outside of Florida? Right now, we're focusing in Florida. I've had opportunities to work in the islands to put mooring balls in so that the the dive boat operators aren't throwing their anchors down on the very resource that brings people to these locations. And so we were looking at getting funding from the World Bank to do projects on that. But, you know, the problem with Ecosphere is the sky's the limit. We can do anything, right? But that's also its Achilles heel. We need to stay focused. And now that we have this big seagrass effort, I have to stay focused on that for the next year or two. But then we can start looking at the horizon. What else can we do to make a difference? Awesome. Well, now it's time for Field Notes. It's that part of our show where we talk to our guests about memorable moments during doing the work that we do. We encourage listeners to share their stories using the hashtag Field Notes so we can read them on a future episode. And I believe you have one that is just filled with irony. (laughs) Yes, I was in regulatory at the Water Management District before I worked for the swim program. And so I was wanting to get in the swim program for a while, but finally the first biologist or first person to ever leave was Dick Eckenrod because he went to run and set up the Tampa Bay Estuary program. So there was an opening and I got it. And so my last day as a regulator, I had to go in the field, meet with the consultant, look at his JD line or jurisdictional limits of where the wetland was. So we're out there. And early in the morning, and I essentially almost sit on a step on a rattlesnake. I mean, <laughs> it was up a couple of inches away. It didn't strike, but when I pulled my other foot away, it tried to strike me. Oh, wow. So at this point, your heart's racing. You're like, I'm full alert. I hope not to see another snake on my last day doing this. And so you go through the rest of the day and don't see any other snakes, of course. So now I'm heading home. And so I'm shut off the high alert. So I run up to my house, which is in the city of Tampa. And here's a big old snake laying right on my doorstep of my house. <laughs> so that scared the crap out of me. Because I'm not looking for this, right? And I, I got scared earlier. But I shut it off, but there was a snake there. So it's just one of those quirky things. <laughs> that is funny. Always love seeing the snakes in the field, but not those rattlesnakes up close and personal. Um, Before we jump off of that, though, maybe talk about what the swim program is. Yeah, the swim program is a very unique program for the state. But back in 1988, the state legislature started this program, and SWIM stands for Surface Water Improvement and Management. So the state said, look, we have a lot of impaired water bodies, from estuary bodies to freshwater bodies. We want every water management district to make a list of their worst water systems that need to help. And so for the Southwest Florida Water Management District, that included Tampa Bay, Sarasota Bay, Charlotte Harbor, and two big lakes, Lake Nota Sassa and Lake Tarpon. There are other rivers and stuff, but those were the five big ones. And they said, look, we're going to give you money. We do not want you to study it. We want you to put projects in. So they hired engineers and restoration ecologists. And so we had $2 million a year. And it was fix it. Go fix it. Hire, figure out where you can. Find property that's public. Figure out what you need. Hire consultants to get the designs done. And then hire contractors. So it was a very effective program. I should look up the numbers, but it's thousands of acres restored, and tens of thousands of acres water quality was improved by retrofitting non-existing stormwater systems. So it's really effective. I love working there. It was like the dream job. But my business partner kept pushing on me to come join her. And luckily for those 22 years, we were able to help the SWIM program put projects in. So my entire career was really a lucky spot for me. So all I ever did was habitat restoration projects. And that's kind of why I wanted to do Ecosphere. 
first for the P3s, and secondly, because I want to give back. I want to do more of this type work, and that gives us an avenue to work on private land. Yeah. And um, I'm just so glad you're doing the work because it is great. I looked back at uh, the salt marsh at Cockroach Bay that we worked on together and and Google Earth. It looks amazing. (laughs) It takes a while, but man, it's coming back nicely. Yeah, it looks great. But I have one question for you that I'm wondering if your wife asks you to, if you are ever going to retire. Yeah, my wife, Karen, is like, I thought you were retired. You're sitting in your office 30 hours a week still. (laughs) And I counter going, well, it's not 60, um, <laughs> but it, it's a good question. I, I'm trying to find a good balance. I want to still do this for a while. I'd like it to be more like 20 hours. So if I probably need to try and hire somebody to not only learn this and help me, but somebody needs to keep this going because I'm not going to work forever, right? But I'm not ready to retire yet. So I'm trying to find that nice sweet spot where I can still do things I want to do and be retired, but still have my hands in this. That's great. Well, I hope that you are enjoying both the work and your less than 60 hours a week right now. And we're running out of time. So is there anything else you want to talk about we didn't touch on? Not particularly, but I do want to thank you for doing these podcasts because the more you put the word out, I think it just it benefits our professional industry and networking and it creates partnerships potentially. And so it's very important that people know what we're trying to do and how that can align with what other agencies are trying to do so that we can work more collaboratively. Awesome. So. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Well, it, this has been really great. And like you said, this is all about this. what this podcast is about, is letting people know what the work is. If you've never done this work before, what kind of work people are doing. Somebody out there listening might not even know that planting seagrass is a job you could have and that there are people out there who aren't doing what they might think environmental professionals do. We all do lots of different things and there's lots of different avenues. And so the one thing we want to leave people with is where can they get in touch with you? Well, you can always get to me through our website, which is ecospherestorationinstitute.org. And you can contact us there. We're always looking for a little bit of financial support, but mostly we would like you to participate. So check us out and we'll get you out on some jobs. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much for being here again today. Thank you. That's our show. Thank you, Tom, for joining us today. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Bye. See you, everybody. <laughs>